tough guys in the audience tonight. <laughs> looking for a tough guy. Looking for a tough guy. Okay, any volunteers? <laughs> oh, tough guy. Oh, come on. There's going to be this one tough guy. Oh, good. Okay, awesome. Oh, he's tough. Ooh. <laughs> 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 okay, so just stand this way. Okay, put your hands up like this. Okay. Take this one and just cover your face. Okay. No, all the way. Maximum protection. Okay, cover your groin. <laughs> okay, ready. One. Two. Just kidding. Thank you. <laughs> I was scared. <laughs> okay. Uh, my name is Ian Blakesley, and I do WordPress. Uh, that's what I'm really into, I love it. Uh, also, I love the martial arts as well. And uh, so tonight I'm gonna talk about lessons for programmers from the martial arts. That's what we're gonna do. Um, back in 2010, I uh, took on a job to train a group of uh, individuals to be a um, elite um, fighting force that would be called in on only the most uh, dangerous missions. And uh, this is a very heavy assignment. Um, it, I wasn't even sure if I wanted to take it or not, but I have a picture here of the first uh, graduating class of that program. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> all of them, all of them, lethal, lethal killers, right across the board. It was one of those cases where I was like, what have I created? Uh, maybe I went too far. <laughs> but, uh, you know, sometimes you gotta take a risk. All right. Um, so. A little bit more background. I love computers, I love working with computers, but when I'm not doing computers, and I'm back in the States, I teach Taekwondo. Uh, I've been doing Taekwondo for the last nine years, and uh, also trained in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Are there anybody in here who's done martial arts in their life? Raise their hand. Oh, even if it was just for like a month? <laughs> cool. All right, well, it's an excellent thing to do. A um, lot, lot of benefits from that. All right. Okay. I love how that end got dropped. That's awesome. <laughs> so, is anybody here old enough to remember this picture? Probably not. All right, that's all right. So, the first thing I'm going to talk about is iteration. Uh, iteration is a really awesome word uh, that you can say if you want to sound really smart. Um, you hear it a lot in project management and software development. Um, but basically, what iteration means is that whatever you're doing is going to go through many, many, many incarnations, many revisions and doing it over again and fixing things and making it better. Um, and it's a beautiful concept, um, something that we should embrace more in our own personal lives. And this is a major part of the martial arts as well. Basically, uh, to get better at a martial art, you have to accept the fact that you're going to fail constantly. You're going to fail on a daily basis. It's going to be the pretty much perpetual taste in your mouth is doing badly all the time. And it's a tough pill to swallow. There's nothing like going voluntarily to a class, knowing that someone's gonna tell you how awful you are five days a week, right? And knowing at the same time that that's what you have to do to get better. But it's a concept worth exploring. All right, let know who this is. Chuck that's right, Chuck Norris, all right. You don't just say Chuck Norris, you say Chuck Norris! <laughs> Chuck Norris! Chuck, that's right, okay. My favorite one was that what did they say? There is, there is no chin behind Chuck Norris's beard, there's only another fist. That's my <laughs> So, um, Chuck Norris is a great poster child for iteration. Anytime you're feeling bad that you failed at something, or that something you made didn't turn out right, something you might not know is Chuck Norris failed his, his first black belt test when he was uh, in Korea. He was stationed in Korea during the Korean War, and he started training in Taekwondo when he was over there. Actually, it was Tang Soo but um, he trained for a long time in Korea with Korean masters, and it's time for his black belt test. And he couldn't test in the town where he was living. He had to drive like four hours to where his master's masters were giving a test and go test with them, which I can tell you would be a really intimidating experience. Um, and Korea gets pretty cold in the winter. I don't know if you guys have been there, but it, it, it gets pretty cold. So Chuck Norris gets himself an army jeep, this is before he was a movie star. He was just a regular dude, okay? He gets himself an army jeep, because he's in the army. And he drives four hours through the Korean winter to this other town where they're doing the black belt test. Now, 
army chiefs don't often have a lot of uh, covering, right? So he's freezing all the way there. He gets to uh, the dojong, the place where they're going to do the test, and it's a cold, freezing room, like a lot of training halls are. They're not going to heat it. They're not going to baby you. So he, he goes from a cold jeep into a cold, freezing room full of unfriendly people who are really not too excited that he's there. And they make him sit in the corner while the rest of the school does their test. He's been training for this now. He's pumped up for it. And finally, after hours of sitting on this cold wooden floor, they call his name. All right? He gets up. He's all cramped up. He's stiff. He's freezing. He gets up in front of the masters. They tell him to begin, and his mind goes totally blank. <laughs> he can't remember anything. Doesn't even know his own name. Fails so bad. You never thought Chuck Norris could fail that bad. And he did. And he didn't pass his test. And he had to drive all the way back in the freezing green winter in a Jeep with no cover and tell his master what he just did, right? Pretty awful experience. But through iterations, you become Walker, Texas Ranger, right? So it it's, um, should, should make you feel a little better anytime something you're working on doesn't quite work right or uh, you have that taste of failure in your mouth. Just tell yourself, okay, Chuck Norris failed his first black belt test. I think I can do this. Um, my girlfriend and I, uh, we, we talk about, about things like, like this a lot, and we're thinking, you know, the word failure is really, um, should be replaced. It should re it's too limiting a terminology for something that's so important to, to your growth. And we sort of batted around some ideas. What can we use instead of that term? Because it's very limiting. It keeps people from, from trying things. And we decided a much better thing to say, instead of failure, is a early prototype, right? So if you, if you think back to that really awkward time when you asked out a girl and she shot you down so hard, don't think, oh, I failed. Think, oh, it was an early prototype, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and you feel better, right? It lets, it lets you realize, OK, it was just one part of a series of, of iterations, right? And you can apply this to anything that you're working on that you know is, is going to burn many, many, many times. It gives you the freedom to try different ideas, the freedom to attempt things that you might get laughed at for, right? So keep that in mind. If you take nothing else from this talk, the phrase is just the early prototype. All right? it'll, it'll make you feel better when you're lying in bed at night. All right? So um, not if you're a doctor. Not if you're a doctor. Right. There are already <laughs> all for, finished products, all perfect. So my, my favorite example uh, of uh, the experience of iteration and being comfortable with failure comes from Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Has anybody here done Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu? Here, I've done. Just here. Oh, okay. Um, so in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, um, they, call, they, they call sparring rolling, that's what they call it. And you, you team up with your partners and you try to submit each other through either choking them or um, extend, hyper extending one of their joints until they have to give up, otherwise, you're going to break something. Uh, and it's a lot of fun, even though that description doesn't sound like fun. <laughs> <laughs> so, and surprisingly enough, you know, a lot of these dudes, they look like scary dudes, but they're some of the most humble, nice people you could ever uh, spend time with. Uh, if you've ever been in the position of having someone choke the life out of you, it humbles you. And so even the toughest people are really humble, and, and uh, they understand that they're, nobody's, the, nobody's the top of the pyramid for long. Someone's going to come along and, and choke them out, too. But um, my, my favorite story about failure and how there's dangers in not accepting a failure, in, in rejecting the concept of failure. Uh, I was rolling with, with uh, another partner in the class. We were sparring. And uh, this was a guy who was better than me. And he would pretty much always tap me out. He would always beat me, which was I was fine with. I really enjoyed training with him. He was a great partner. Well, this one particular night, I happened to get the upper hand. And I sunk in a really, really deep um, choke on his neck, right? So I'm on top of him, and I'm squeezing the life out of this guy. And I'm looking down at him, and this is, sounds really awful. But he's, he's making gurgling sounds, and there's like spit coming out of his mouth, and his face is turning red. I am crushing this guy's, this guy's windpipe. And I'm going tighter and tighter and tighter, and thinking, I've got this, I've got this, you know. And he's, he's just not tapping. He's not giving up. He's, he's hanging on. And it's getting, I'm kind of getting grossed out by the whole thing. I'm, I'm starting to worry about the guy, but I'm squeezing tighter and tighter and tighter and crushing his neck. And, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed. I'm like, how is this guy hanging on, right? This guy will not give up, you know, because sometimes you, your pride gets the better of you, right? So I'm, I'm choking him, and I'm squeezing him, and I'm twisting, and it's just getting ugly. And your matches are timed. 
And the, the professor, in Jiu-Jitsu, you refer to the master as a professor. The professor yells out, okay, Ty, everybody stop. And I let him go, and I think, ah, oh, wow, he hung on, right? And he, I wasn't able to tap him. Um, and he puts his hand on my shoulder, and he says, I should have tapped. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what happens when you don't accept iteration, when you don't accept failure, that you have to go through this to get better. The faster, the faster you, you learn that lesson, the faster you can have a rematch, the faster you can move on and try again. But if you keep letting yourself get injured or harmed by the fear of failure, you know, if you let, if you let yourself get harmed by that, it slows down your growth tremendously, right? If you can embrace the fact that there's gonna be failures, you're gonna grow so much faster, so much faster. Okay. Leadership. All right, anybody remember, anybody remember this one? <laughs> Okay, this is some vintage stuff here, all right? So, uh, you, you got the little master there uh, on looking, making sure that nobody goes too far, you know? Um, but leadership as it carries over from the martial arts into programming, for most of you have, have some sort of career ambition, right? I mean, all of us like working on the, the regular problems that we, that we work on, the, the challenges of, of ordinary programming, but most of us also would have an, a dream of where we'd like to take our career. And to take it there, there's going to be some leadership involved. There's going to be some sort of, um, you're going to have to step up in some way. So um, one of the best environments to learn that is through a, through a martial art, because uh, it's all about uh, taking, taking charge of, of, of a, um, a class sometimes, becoming a teacher, developing some type of leadership skill. Um, when I uh, first started training, I fell so in love with the martial arts, that I just wanted to spend all my time there, right? I, I, I was the guy that would show up and, and mop the floors, you know, that I, I love to help out with, with the hopes of maybe learning a little something extra, but also just because I liked being in the environment. So I was there all the time. And you never know when leadership is gonna sneak up on you. So one day, when I was still fairly low ranking, I'm at the school early, and I'd gotten a key at that point, because if someone wants to clean your school, you give them a key, right? Hey, what's better than that? So I'm at the school early, let myself in, I'm cleaning the place, students start showing up, but the master doesn't arrive. So more students show up, the master doesn't arrive. More students are showing up. It's time for class, there's no master. But I'm there. The phone rings, I answer the phone, it's the master. Hey, guess what? Car broke down, you're teaching the class. There's nothing like being thrust into a situation like that to strike fear to your heart, right? Especially when it's like those killers you saw at the beginning. <laughs> oh man, six-year-old, brutal. <laughs> so you can't say no to the master. That's like the first lesson in Mark. So of course I say, yes sir! You know, I hang up the phone, oh my god! I gotta teach a class. It was awful! This goes back to the iteration again, okay? The first class you teach is gonna be terrible. The first leadership position you take, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. But that's how it starts, right? You have to embrace that opportunity, even though you know there's going to be some bad, bad stuff, right? It's, um, it, it's the price you pay for taking your current situation and moving it towards the dream you have for your career, right? So maybe you're working on a project, or you hear a project mentioned, and there's no obvious leader, but you think you might be able to do it. Or at least you think you might be able to do a really awful job of it. Step up, okay? The things you're gonna learn in that situation are going to bring your skills up to a level that would never happen if you just keep your head down and keep writing the same code and keep fixing the same bugs, right? All right, everybody's gotta know who this guy is, right? <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> I feel like Krusty the Clown up here. It's like every, every <laughs> spot. All right. This is, uh, oh god, this is nerdy. OK, this is, Com this is Commander Riker. If anyone watched uh, the second Star Trek uh, uh, series. <laughs> so he's basically second in command of the Enterprise after Captain Picard. And um, the reason I have him up here is many of us, uh, who decide to take on leadership positions end up in the Commander Riker position, right? Which looks pretty badass when you're not in the Commander Riker position, right? You realize you can't step into Picard's shoes right away. You can't become the captain right away. 
But if you can step into those shoes, you're going to learn a lot. Still, you know, you're a leader. You're running the show when the guy's not around. And there's a little bit of, of a secret about being Commander Riker that you don't find out until you get into the position of being number two in an organization, even though they call him number one, which is kind of a, a goofy thing to do. The secret of Commander Riker is that nobody else wants his job. All right? So that leadership position in your company that you kind of dream about taking because you're ambitious and you think there's a lot of competition for it, there isn't. Nobody else wants that position. They're all terrified. So the chances of you getting it are really high, right? Throw your hat in the ring. Step up. It's going to be awful. But there's much less competition for it than you thought, right? Leadership scares people. If it doesn't scare you, give it a shot. If it does scare you, even more reason to give it a shot. All right. I can't believe nobody knew who Riker was. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Also, I, I hadn't planned on keeping this on this long. <laughs> I, I gotta add it on. This is not the first time that I've undressed in the <laughs> public around here. About a month ago, I came to an event here, and walking around in KL, first of all, I'm the only person that walks around in KL, but it's also faster than the traffic. <laughs> but, uh, the problem with walking in KL is it's really hot. So anywhere you get, you're just soaking wet when you get there. So I usually bring an extra shirt or two to change. So I'm not some crazy, you know, don't look like a crazy sweaty American tourist or something like that. So that last time, I, I'm downstairs, you know, and uh, I'm like, I gotta change my shirt, and there's nowhere to change. And I'm like, running around trying to find some sort of um, alley or nook downstairs where there's no people around, so I can just rip my shirt off and put the other one on. This has nothing to do with programming, by the way. <laughs> and, so I'm like, I need to do this, and I need to find a spot. But there's tons of like grandmas everywhere, <laughs> everywhere. It's like it's like the whole subway below Mind Valley unloaded a trainload of grandmas, and they're just standing around looking at me, and I can't find any privacy. So I have a brilliant idea. What would Superman do? There's an elevator right over there. I'm gonna use the elevator as my personal changing room. I'll be quick. What could happen? So I run over, I look around, lots of grandmas, see you later grandma, get into the elevator, I tear my shirt off as fast as I can. Two problems. If you've ever tried to tear your shirt off as fast as you can, it ends up stuck over your head, like you're in a <laughs> hockey fight, okay? So you're stuck like this and you can't get out of the fat. Problem number two, if you don't hit a floor button on an elevator, it just opens up again. <laughs> Here open, and I think, oh my god, <laughs> it's Magic Mike. If anyone knows who Magic Mike is, oh god. <laughs> okay, right, look it up on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Whoop. Whoop. Okay, here we go. Money. Okay, money <coughs> lessons from the martial arts that you can carry over into the programming world. So, um, I was fortunate enough uh, that my uh, jiu-jitsu professor uh, had trained with the Gracie family in Brazil and was uh, very connected with them. Everybody says that about their jiu-jitsu instructor, by the way. All right. I, but mine was for real. <laughs> so, he told us a really great story one day. Um, he got up in front of the class and he said, he said how did we sell Brazilian jiu-jitsu? when we came to America? How did we sell it? And everyone thought about this, and this is interesting, because in the last 15, 20 years, it's really taken off, mostly in the last 10 years. It's become really huge. It's, it, uh, it's a very popular art of practice. So they said, how do we sell it? How do we market this to the world? And everybody thought about it, but nobody really had an answer. And he said, we sold it with the UFC. That family had been very um, instrumental in the creation of that. Is that popular over here? Yeah. You've watched it? Oh, I think it's so they used the UFC as this, as this uh, mode of marketing their martial art because it, it was so dominant in that, uh, in that arena in the early days. And still, it's still very dominant. And so that was what was their major marketing tool. And, and everyone wanted to learn this art all of a sudden because dudes on TV that were doing it were crushing everybody, right? <laughs> and what he said was, is you, we sold it with the spectacle, right? And the way this relates to your work, if you want to make more money as a programmer, if you want to make more money doing what you love to do, you need to sell it with a spectacle. No one's gonna, gonna pay you a ton of extra money to keep, like I said, fixing the same bugs and doing the same things you're already doing, unless somehow you're, you're 
insane at that and it's in, in some micro niche. But if you can create a spectacle, if you can create something that draws people's attention and blows their minds, they'll hire you to do what you love to do, what you're good at, right? You gotta sell the spectacle of it. That might take a while to, to sink in, how do I make my sort of mundane work into a spectacle? But computer programming is pretty amazing, right? No, no matter what you do, whether it's front end, whether it's back end, you can do amazing stuff that a lot of other people cannot do, right? Uh, anybody, how many people here have cars? Okay, don't worry, I'm not gonna ask you for a ride home. <laughs> I, I do not know how to work on cars, right? And uh, my girlfriend's dad, I think, oh, it bothers him that I don't know how to do that, right? It's like I'm lacking this manly skill. But um, So when I take a car to a mechanic, what he does looks like magic to me, right? He can, I can tell, I told my mechanic, it's making this crazy sound. And he's like, yeah, I know what that is. And, he fixed it, right? It looks like magic to me because I don't know how to do it. And the same thing's true for what everyone in this room does, right? What, if you do, if, if you're a PHP uh, person, you know, if you're a JavaScript person, if you're a graphic designer, oh my God, that's amazing, right? The, the magic that everyone else sees seems really boring to you, but it really does look like magic to everyone else, right? And that's what you have to remember. If anyone's ever, and ever done a, a half-assed attempt to learn to play guitar, when you learn that first song, all your friends are like, that sounds just like that song, that's awesome, right? It could be terrible, but your friends are blown away because they can't do it, right? <laughs> so what you can do is magic, and that's how you gotta sell it. Sell it as magic, right? Okay. Um, the other thing to keep in mind about money is that something worth learning is worth paying for. And this is a two-sided, a two-sided thing that you can benefit from both sides. I love free information on the internet, right? What's better than a free tutorial that solves your problem? It's great, I use it all the time, right? YouTube's awesome, Google's awesome, Stack Overflow, awesome, right? But if you really wanna get good at stuff, you gotta mix that with actually paying for real awesome knowledge. You gotta balance it, and that will take you way further than spending 12 hours looking for that one free tutorial. So if it's worth learning, it's worth paying for. But this also benefits you because if you can teach something, if you have some awesome knowledge, someone will pay you to do it. Someone will pay you to show them, right? If it's worth learning, someone will pay you for it, all right? And if you can convey that information in a way that people understand, in a way that, that makes sense to them and they feel that they can use, that's money, that equals money. The same is true in the martial arts. If you can show someone how to use their body in a particular way, right? in a way they understand, in a way that they're comfortable with. If you can teach them a technique so that they say, oh, I know how to use that now and I know why I would use that, that's money. So if you want to make more money, that's a skill to cultivate, to be able to explain something to someone in a way that makes sense to them. Does that make sense? Oh, awesome. Then I succeeded. Okay. Where's my money? <laughs> All right. Community. <laughs> so, um, this is awesome. This was a rad game. It was called Double Dragon. I don't know if anyone's heard of Double Dragon. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Double Dragon, right? You start off, you fight your way through like, this, this, this dystopian urban environment full of crazy steroid people who want to beat you up, right? You get to the end, and then you got to fight yourself. What kind of head trip is that? All right? Awesome. <laughs> Which brings me to community. <laughs> People love WebCamp because you're in a room full of people who are excited about the same things you're excited about, right? When you sign up for a martial arts class, when you train in a martial art, you are in a room full of people who are aiming their efforts at the same goal, right? You're working together, and that has a powerful energy. There's nothing better than that, right? And actually, the more specific you get, the more intense it gets, all right? If you're a JavaScript person, and you go to a JavaScript meetup, and you're hanging out with the people that love JavaScript, it has an energy, it pumps you up, right? If you're into WordPress, like me, and you talk with a bunch of other people who love WordPress, it pumps you up. There is something so energizing about a community of people all working towards the same goal, and you should capitalize on that, right? If you're surrounded by people in your day job who are boring, or where it's like working with like a bunch of dead fish, this is not the community for you. This will not help you get where you wanna go. You should be so pumped by the people you work around that you love going there because you're going to do something awesome with all of them, right? I know it sounds like a dream scenario, but make it happen, right? 
community will take you further than you can ever get on your own. The, the, the beauty of the community of martial arts is that you could be training next to someone who's a multi-millionaire and you would never know it. I mean, you'll get to know them after a while, but all people of all levels are all the same next to each other and it, all that matters is it's results-based. It's, it's how long you've been training and how much effort you've put in and uh, you know, what you've been able to do and absorb. And that access to such a wide variety of people with a similar interest opens up doors that uh, you would never be able to do just by introducing yourself to a stranger, right? Same is true in the, the web community. You might go to a meetup for whatever your particular interest is, maybe it's database stuff, right? And maybe there's people at the meetup who love database as much as you do, and they happen to have resources or access to people that you would never be able to get in contact with, and because you both have this common language that you're so excited about, they're gonna give you access to that. So understand how important community is. I know we all tend to become hermits and work for 16 hours you know, in front of our computers, and we like it that way. But if you wanna uh, fulfill this dream you have of, of your, your, your aspirations for, for what you want your career to be or, or what your dream project is, you're gonna need to tap into a community for that. All right, and the end. Thank you very much. <laughs>